We're in the Gospel of John chapter 2 as we get into the second part of our Mother's Day message on the wedding in Cana. John chapter 2, starting with verse 1, the Word of God says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. We talked about this last week. Why was that so significant? Before a miracle, before people knew he was the Messiah, Jesus was a part of somebody's wedding list because he was a cool person. He was nice. He was warm. He was kind. And we were challenged to be nice. Uh, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Jesus very affectionately and lovingly said, woman, precious woman, why did you involve me? My hour has not yet come. His mother then said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for bringing us to this space where we can worship, where we can honor the mothers in our congregation, and where you can also honor the mothers in our congregation. May this message be a tremendous blessing for all. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week was a little bit of a challenging message. I told you I wouldn't have preached it in my first year, but since last Sabbath was my first Sabbath out of the first year, I was willing to do so. And that is that oftentimes God places relationship before being right. He puts more import on relationship than on being right. God is always right, and that will always be proven in the end. It will bear itself out that God is right, that God is just, that God is love. But because of our limitations, because of our lack of faith, because we have a skewed perspective, God often will condescend, come down to our level, and, and, and relate to us as such. And so there were many situations in the Old Testament and the New Testament where God had to say, okay, Moses, we'll do it your way. Okay, Abraham, we'll do it your way. And in this story, it seems that the same thing is going on here. Mother, it is not my time. What you need me to do would require a miracle, and I'm telling you, it is not yet my hour. It is not time for it to be known who I am. I don't want to cause too much distraction. I'd rather people get to know me through the teachings first before the miracles become a bit of a distraction and begin to catch the attention of Rome. I just need to operate on the down low for a little bit longer. It is not yet my hour. So Jesus pulls the divinity card saying, Mom, no, it's not time. And Mary plays the mama card. And we learned last week... <laughs> I guess sometimes the mama card trumps the, the, the divine card. I didn't know that could be possible. So, but we learned at the very end of the message last week that Mary's reaction to what Jesus says is still with great respect. She basically says, I'm going to trust you, son. Tells the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. So in other words, Jesus, if you don't want to perform a miracle, then don't tell him anything. I just trust you enough. I know you well enough that you're going to do your best and that you will honor me, that you will affirm me, that you will help me in this situation. I just trust my life, my problems, my issues, my baggage. I trust it, my trauma. I trust all of it in your hands. Amen? And so she gives this to Jesus. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. So now Jesus has a little bit of a quandary. And I told you last week, I believe that the father texts Jesus and says, uh, do what your mama says. <laughs> the Bible says in verse 6 that nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. Why is this important? Why is this important? Why would John need to describe these jars as used for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons? Well, one, John wants us to know these are large vessels. These are large vessels that Jesus is asking for, right? This is not the arrowhead stuff that you put on your water dispenser. You know, those are hard. Those are hard to lift. You know that, right? These are bigger than that. He, Christ is using 
massive vessels for what he's about to do. But the ceremonial washing is really important, right? This is not just washing for cleanliness. This is not washing just for sanitary purpose. This is, this is ceremonial washing. It's significant in a, a number of the religious experiences that the people had. It is what we might look at as baptism today, that we go through the baptism right because it cleanses us. It's symbolic of cleansing us of unrighteousness, dying to self, and, and so on and so forth. God often used water as symbolic of his work in people's lives. You look at Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. He says, I will cleanse you from all of the things that have defiled you. I will wash you, cleanse you of everything that has defiled you. And then goes on to say, I will give you, in verse 26, a new heart and a new mind and put my spirit in you. This is before Ezekiel 37 where he calls Israel dry bones, but he says you will be resurrected and be a living army. So Jesus chooses to use water because I'm going to let you know something right now. Anytime you feel like you get what you want, that you've gotten your way, you told God what you want him to do, and he's like, ah, it's not a good idea. And you said, no, Lord, give me what I'm asking for. I will wrestle you all night long until you bless me. And God gives in and says, okay, just know there will be lessons in doing it your way. There will be lessons in doing your way. In other words, God is always going to take advantage of every single opportunity to teach us something. This may not have been God's first primary uh, divine will, his, his, his perfect will to turn water uh, into grape juice, into wine, but, but he's going to take advantage of the symbolism of all of it. The Bible says that Jesus asked the servants to get these large vessels. And then Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water so that they were filled to the brim. The water in this illustration is representative of the baptism that Jesus just had in the Jordan River. It is, it is, it is representative of the baptism he calls all of us to experience. Being baptized not only by water but by by the Spirit, according to the gospel. Jesus has them fill them up with water. And so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Now, if I am a hired servant at this wedding, and I know that they have run out of Martinelli, sparkling apple cider, and they have requested more sparkling apple cider. I will not get Aquafina. I am not going to give them Dasani. I am not going to turn on the tap water and fill up these jars. I'm telling you right now, my job depends on me doing as I am asked. And, and delivering the product that has been requested. And these servants know exactly what the master of ceremonies wants. They know what the bridegroom wants. They know what the people want. And Jesus says, give them water. <laughs> you have to understand something. They've never seen a miracle before, <laughs> right? We read into this like, oh, we know what's about to happen. They don't. All they've heard is Jesus... I'm going to trust you with this, servants, whatever he asks you to do. All right. All right, mom, you want me to help you out? All right, here we go. I'm going to give you some water from Arrowhead. Now, let me tell you something. Is water better for their bodies than, than the wine? So Jesus really is basically telling the guests, y'all are dehydrated. And you've been drinking too much already. I'm going to give you what your bodies absolutely need. I'm going to give you the best stuff. This is water. H2O. Now, I, growing up, we didn't like water. We would only drink water when we thought we were going to die. And that was only on hot summer days. When you've been running around and you're just sweating, and then you're like, oh, I need some water, and you would see the hose out there in the front yard. Remember that water from the hose? And you could taste the copper in the water. Remember that? 
but wasn't it delicious? Oh, I would turn that water on and I would just let it shoot up and then just gently, oh, I love that water. So good. This is before bottled water, before the genius came up with bottling water. This is, a, this is how, kids, this is how we got our water. From the hose. That was the only time I wanted water. But I never would choose water over punch. I would never choose water over tang. I'm taking you back, huh? Now, we didn't have a lot of means growing up, and so my mom found ways to kind of let things last. She would, she would find, she'd always see the long game. She's like, all right, I bought some green punch. We used to call it green, you know, not green punch, but yeah, we did. We had purple drink is what we call it. Can I have some drink, right? So purple drink. And you know that stuff is just, it's, it's poison, right? Tastes amazing, but it's poison. So my mom thought, hey, I want this to last as long as it possibly can. So if we were going to have some drink, we always had to dilute it with water. So half of it was green stuff or purple stuff or orange stuff or red stuff, and the other half was water. And once the gallon got to about half full, my mom would just fill the rest of it up with water, and that was it. We didn't have to dilute it anymore. My friends would joke coming to my house, oh, hey, do you have any purple water? Because there's almost no sugar, man. It was like mostly tap water. But we had, our taste, busted, taste buds had adjusted. That purple water was good. And it was refreshing. In fact, I think it's probably why we lived as long as we have so far. My mom didn't even know she was helping us out health-wise, right? Dilute your soda. <laughs> I guess that's diet. Is that diet? I don't know. So the Bible is very clear here. Jesus tells them to fill it up with water. And here's the funny part. They, they fill it up to the brim. I mean, they're, they're taking their job serious. And it's not like they know Jesus like that. They probably just know Mary. And they know Mary's in charge. Mary's probably the one signing their checks. So they're just saying, hey, she said, do whatever he tells us to do. We're just going to do it. But here's the tough part. They did so. But then Jesus asked them, he says, he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. <laughs> All right, like, again, they get paid to do this. They get paid to be servants. They get paid to do their job. And the master of the banquet is requesting more wine, and they fill up the cups with water, and Jesus says, yes, now give that to the master of the banquet. Now, if I was a servant, I would probably say, you, you, you sure you don't want to, like, some of the concentrate? You got some powder stuff somewhere? Kool-Aid? Like, something I could just put in this water? I mean, some of the stuff we can get at Costco? I mean, I'm just, I, I get what you're asking, Jesus, but what you're asking me to do doesn't make sense. Anybody ever been there before? Anybody ever been there before in their relationship with Jesus where he asked you to do something and it didn't make sense to you and you felt like he couldn't possibly be asking me to do this because it goes against everything that I understand and know that is logical, rational. I, 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 my, my feelings are engaged. My intuition is engaged. I got this gut feeling right now. I'm not about to embarrass myself. I'm not about to lose my job. I'm not about to lose credibility. I hear what you're saying, God, but I must, must be real with you. Something must be lost in translation. Some of us will start saying stuff like this. Oh, it's just cultural. That's stuff that... The, Back then, that's what they believed. But today, no, no, no. God could possibly expect us to refrain from X, Y, and Z. I'm going to be honest with you right now. Many of us who are asking for a word from God that want him to speak in a, into a situation that they're in right now, many of us are, 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 are faced with the same situation where we're saying, God, I'm clear. I'm telling you what I need. I'm telling you what I want, but I don't hear anything. I'm going to tell you something right now. When you don't hear from God, it's because he's already spoken. I need to say that one again. When you're not hearing from God, 
on what you should do, where you should go, how you should handle a situation, it is because he's already spoken and you just refuse to listen. You don't want to read that. Now, well, I, I know what he, I mean, yes, but, but I, you have to understand, I was really going through something. God's like, yeah, I get it. I get it. I've been through some stuff too. Um, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. That's hard, isn't it? That's hard. That's hard, especially in a culture that tells us that we must listen. We must listen to our heart. We must listen to our gut. We must follow our instincts. We must trust our intuition. And I know women, on special Mother's Day, let me acknowledge, I know you have a sixth sense. I get it. I get it, but as blasphemous as this is going to sound, you're not always right. Can I be honest on Mother's Day Sabbath? You're not always right. Sometimes you're just wrong and dead wrong, like where you just miss it. And I, I get it because you come to these conclusions with, I know, that, I know it's scientific for you. I know it's scientific. But sometimes the science is just bad. And in these moments, in these moments, as much as I believe everyone should acknowledge their feelings, everyone should address their emotions, everyone should say, I feel this way, it's, it, it matters, it's important, I want to be heard, absolutely. But once you decide to make a decision, it must be measured. What has God said already on this topic? What has God said on this topic? This is not just for mothers. This is for fathers. This is for husbands. This is for wives. This is, this is for children. This is for everyone. However you identify, whatever your pronoun is, this is for all. What has God already said on this topic? So I imagine they probably pause when Jesus says, yeah, take the water over to the master of the banquet. I just imagine they probably just stood there for a while just looking at Jesus, making sure they heard exactly what he said. And Jesus is like, go. This family is where faith comes in. Faith in the Greek, pistis, is the same word that is used for trust and the same word that is used for belief. Faith is not some mystical understanding and revelation that we have. In fact, the Bible says that faith, its own definition, Hebrews 11 verse 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Meaning, faith is not just some kind of ethereal, like, oh, whimsical, oh, I hope. No, no, faith is not hope. Faith is the substance of hope. It's tangible. It's substantive. Faith, this is why James argued, faith without works isn't even real. The way you know I believe is because you see my actions. And I move in faith because I trust what the master has said. Now, I know, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. This is the tough part. This is why many of us fail when it comes to our relationship with God and, and reaching the next level of our experience with God. Because what is required next is to do something that doesn't look right, feel right, seem right, but God told us, and so we do it. I, I, no, no, you, you, gotta, you gotta get this, right? It makes no sense for a shepherd to go against a trained fighting machine like Goliath with just rocks. That makes no sense. It makes no sense to march around the walls of Jericho seven times and on the seventh day to do it seven times while you are in reach of the archers and you have your battle plans and Joshua's like, you guys want to know what the battle plan is? Tell us what the battle plan is. Okay, the first day, ooh, this is going to be good. Joshua, he's a leader, man. Ooh, he's the one who's taking Moses' place. Ooh, he's a young person. He knows what he's talking about. Tell us, Joshua. And Joshua says, all right, the first day, we march. 
Okay, and we march and we do what? We just march. Okay, but, but what about the second day? Second day? You're going to love this plan. We march again. Can you imagine what that looked like in their war room? These are the walls of Jericho. You don't defeat their soldiers. They, they have the advantage, and you just want us to walk around. I'm telling you right now, if you want the results, you must obey. I know that word is a trigger word. I'm so sorry. I know it's triggering. I know, obey. Triggering. I get it. I get it. But listen to who you're obeying. You're obeying the one who knows it all. You're obeying the one who loves you the most. You're obeying the one who has given everything to you. This is not you just blindly trusting someone. This is looking at their track record, even in your own life, not just in Scripture, in your own life. And when he tells you to do something, we obey. We trust and we obey. Yes, because there's no other way. Yes, I know. It's a great song. I get it. I get it. I get it. But it is the only way. So we do it. One of my favorite descriptions of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea comes from Patriarchs and Prophets, one of, one of those great books. And the author says that the Red Sea didn't just part like we see in the movies, where it parts and there's a perfect path and everybody was like, oh, dry land, let's go. She stated that the Red Sea parted as they stepped. Y'all didn't hear me. <laughs> that means there was a sea in front of them, and it would not recess until they stepped into it. And for those you say, well, that's not necessarily biblical. That's imagination. How do we know for sure that happened? Go no further than the book of Joshua, the Jordan River during the flood season. That river did not stop. Pastor Ivar, as you know this, it didn't stop until they took the Ark of the Covenant with four men and they walked into the middle of the river during the flooding season, meaning it was, it was fast. It, it, you could kill yourself doing that. It wasn't until they got into the middle of the raging river and then it stopped. Did it make sense to walk into a river that's that fast, that dangerous? Absolutely not. But who told them to do it? Who told them to do it? I'm telling you right now, many of us are paralyzed where we are because we're not trusting God when he tells us to move out. We're not trusting him. You have to step out in faith first. And this is what God is calling them to do. Take the water to the master of the banquet. And they could have doubted, and they could have had questions, and they could have wondered, is their job is on the line? They could have had all those issues. But here's what they did, and this is what I want you to get. They listened and obeyed. Do I need to say that again? They listened and they obeyed. They took that water. Now, they may have been trembling. They may have been like, here it is. Because we can still make decisions in faith even while we're doubting. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Do I need to say that again? Faith is not the absence of doubt, just like courage is not the absence of fear. Faith simply says, I'm going to do it even though I doubt and I'm not seeing everything and I'm a little nervous, I'm still going to do it anyway. Faith looks doubt in the face and says, I acknowledge that you're here at this wedding party, but my master has told me to do this and I will be obedient. I'm sure David had fear before he fought Goliath, but his courage overcame his fear. Amen? His faith overcame the fear and the doubt. And this is what God has called us to do. Do you know how many things I've done in faith? I'm crying Weeping, doubting, but God told me to do it, and I just stepped out. God is calling you that. You have those testimonies. I know you do. I know some of you have those testimonies. God hears. God is listening. I'm thinking of my dear sister, Nina, who's in the hospital right now. We want to say hi to Sister Nina. Please send text messages. Love on her. 
We've had a chance to visit her all throughout the week. But when you look at her life and you look at the series of faith and how she's walked in her life, how she, she's, she emphasizes, she tells, she tells me this all the time. She says, I get tired of hearing grace. I said, Sister Nina, y'all can you get tired? I get tired of hearing grace, Pastor. I want to see grace in action. I said, oh, I got you. I got you. Makes no sense if we're going to talk about God's grace and his love if we're not exemplifying it. We got to move. We got to be out in the community. We got, people got to be able to feel that love and feel that grace through our deeds of service. And that's why you're not going to find someone who is more intentional and deliberate about serving her community. It's not even, there are things that are not even church functions, and she's involved in it because she wants to bless people. Sister Nina, we're thinking of you, we're praying for you, we can't wait to see you back here. But faith is action. Faith is action. It's substantive, and that's what these men do. They walk over to the master of the banquet. Now, this is what I love. Watch this. This is what I love. The Bible says, and the master of the banquet tasted the what? What does it say he tasted? He tasted the what? No one didn't say wine. He tasted the water, which had become wine. May I use my sanctified imagination here? Is it possible that the water did not turn to wine until it touched his tongue? This smells like Dasani. <laughs> Sir, um, you asked us to give you wine, and um, we uh, tried to um, meet your request, and um, this is the wine. Um, there was a guy who told us to fill the jars with water, and... Um, Oh, don't fire us. <laughs> That's how I drink my Welch's, by the way. <laughs> I believe it did not turn into wine or grape juice, it's the same word, it's the same word in the Greek for fermented or non-fermented, it's the same word, until it touched his lips. Because that's just how God does it. He's extra like that. He wants to make sure that every step of the way, your faith is engaged. You want to cross over the Red Sea? Yeah, then step. But there's sharks. I just saw a shark go by. Step. The Bible tells us, he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best until when? Now. This is my opinion. You don't, you don't have to trust it. It doesn't matter. Not salvific. I believe what God turned that water into was the original grape juice, the stuff that you would get from Eden. I believe when he tasted it, he had never tasted anything as amazing as this. I just believe if God had a choice to give the best, he's going to give the best. That's what I believe. I, I'm, I'm not saying that the guests weren't drunk. They, they may very well, according to the text, most likely were. I just believe that whatever Jesus gave was perfect. Now let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. I believe so because just as the water was representative of the baptism, the wine was representative of his blood. And Jesus' blood is pure. Jesus' blood is untainted. Jesus' blood is the blood of the new covenant. And it had to represent his blood. Couldn't be spoiled. Jesus in this miracle, does something so special. Yes, his mom wanted, his mom wanted him to simply provide more wine, more beverages for the wedding. 
Jesus turned it into a pulpit. He will save the best for last, and this is exactly what God does. God does this in the life of his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 says that Jesus is the perfect radiance of the Father. In the past, God had spoken to us by the prophets in many different ways through dreams and visions. But now in these last days, the author says he is speaking through us through his son, who is the perfect radiance of the Father, the exact representation of his glory. Jesus was the best. He was better than Moses. He was better than Joshua. He was better than Abraham. He was better than David. He was better than Ruth. He was better than Esther. He was better than Deborah. He was better than all of them before. Jesus is the perfect representation of who God is. And in this miracle, he gives us symbolism that points not only to his baptism, but to his death. And this is what I love the most. Watch this, watch this, because you can't miss this point. As deeply theological as this space is right now, at the wedding, a wedding that Jesus would use as a parable in many of his sermons, a wedding that represents the wedding between God and his people, Jesus being the ultimate bridegroom. What's beautiful about this miracle, and you can't miss this point, is he chooses to do this just so people's needs are met even on the most minuscule, unimportant levels, God desires to empathize with us, sympathize with us. The gospel has power because Jesus meets our very need. Jesus meets our very need. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read something to you. Mavis, I didn't even put, I didn't give this to you, Mavis. I didn't give this to you. This is in Desire of Ages. I love this. She writes, Ellen White writes, we should all become witnesses for Jesus. Social power sanctified by the grace of Christ must be improved in winning souls to the Savior. Social power, she says. She's talking about us simply being social, showing up at weddings. That's what she's talking about. Showing up at parties, hanging out with people for their birthdays. She's saying we must improve on this stuff. Sanctified by the grace of Christ, we must improve in winning souls to the Savior. Let the world see that we are not selfishly absorbed in our own interest. Let me slide this in. All of our Daniel and Revelation seminars. We're not selfishly absorbed in our interest, but what we desire others to share in our blessings, that, but that we desire others to share in our blessings and privileges. Let them see that our religion does not make us unsympathetic or exacting. Let all who profess to have found Christ minister as he did for the benefit of men. We should never give to the world the false impression that Christians are gloomy, unhappy people. You had no idea she wrote stuff like this. Because you thought she was gloomy and unhappy, didn't you? Be honest. We must never give the world the false impression that Christians are a gloomy, unhappy people. If our eyes are fixed on Jesus, we shall see a compassionate Redeemer and shall catch light from his countenance. Wherever his spirit reigns, there, are, there peace abides. And there will be a joy also, for there is a calm, holy trust in God. Christ is pleased with his followers, when they show that they, though they're human, they are partakers of the divine nature. They are not statues. Oh, I love that word. They're not just statues. But living men and women, their hearts refreshed by the dews of divine grace, open and expand to the sun of righteousness. The light that shines upon them, they reflect upon others in works that are luminous with the love of Christ. Jesus chose to pack all of these lessons in a wedding celebration that would let you know that Jesus died so that he can laugh with you. Jesus died, gave his life so that you could have joy. Jesus died, shed his blood, that wine, so that you could have peace. Jesus did all of these things 
so you could party, so you could laugh, so that you could dance, so that you could experience joy. Christ says in John 15, I give you joy, my joy. That your joy may be full and that your joy may be complete. Church family, as I invite the praise team to come forward. Mama knows best. Right? Mama knows best because she asked Jesus to do something that may not have been on his itinerary, but the moment was perfect to launch his ministry. It wasn't him walking on water or giving sight to the blind. It was Jesus making sure they had enough plastic forks and spoons. Because <laughs> God cares even about that kind of stuff. Mama knows best. Mama knows best and Jesus, he would take these lessons and every step of his life, every step of his life, he was caring for people in the macro ways and also in the micro ways. And even family, when Jesus was on the cross and his blood, the blood of the new covenant was being shed, while he was facing all the powers of hell, your God, my God, saw his mommy. With everything collapsing around him, Jesus looked to his mommy, looked at his closest friend, John, said, Mom, this is going to be your new son. And friend, this is your new mom. Take care of my mama. The way that she is taking care of me, the way that she stands here with me right now in this dark moment. God is thinking of you. The small things, the big things. And he stands by you. Trust him. It may not always make sense, but it is always sensible to follow Jesus. Father God, thank you so much. We trust you. Thank you for this moment. Doing as we've asked and finding in those moments a way of revealing your character. We're not going to be statues. We're not going to be Christians who are not joyous. We're going to trust you. Even if it doesn't feel good in the moment, we're going to trust you because you know better than we. Thank you. You know best. You know best. <laughs>